When people think about trams, especially in Australia, they often think about Melbourne, the city that has the largest urban tram network in the world. However, that wasn't always the case. Sydney used to have a larger tram network than Melbourne, and at one point had the largest tram network in the Southern Hemisphere. But, like so many other great tram networks of their time, it was demolished to make more space on the road for cars. When that happened, many of Sydney's lost tram lines were converted into bus routes, and many of these bus routes are still in operation today. But, as many people have noted, the decision to replace trams with buses was a short sighted one. The typical tram can hold more people than a typical bus, and in greater comfort, which is important for a city like Sydney where overcrowding has become a real challenge for the bus network. And, with a growing focus on more environmentally friendly forms of transport, trams powered by overhead electric wires easily beat diesel-powered buses in terms of environmental impact, and even still win over the newer electric buses that use lithium-ion batteries. So, it would be great if Sydney had followed Melbourne's lead and never gotten rid of their trams. But, unfortunately, we can't change the past. With that said, Sydney is doing something about it, and in recent years has set out to start building a new tram or light rail network, parts of which even follow the same alignments as the city's old tram network did over a hundred years ago. After Sydney ran the last service on its old tramway network in 1961, it would be just 36 years before trams made their return to the city, in the form of Sydney's first and slightly odd new light rail line, the L1 Inner West Line, which opened in 1997. One of the things that gives the line its slightly odd character is that it was built over a disused freight railway that used to connect the industrial docks in Piermont and Darling Harbour with the main freight lines running out through the city. In many ways, the project shares a lot of similarities with the Docklands Light Railway, or DLR, system over in London. In both cases, you had a significant Dockland and industrial area that had fallen into disuse in the mid to late 20th century, as shipping shifted focus to container ports that required more space than these old docks could accommodate. In Sydney's case, the shipping shifted to the port in Botany Bay, and like how Canary Wharf was redeveloped into a major business centre in London, Sydney's Darling Harbour was turned into a commercial and tourist precinct, while nearby Piermont grew as an office and residential hub. For both cities, it was deemed these new precincts needed transport connections, and light rail was the mode of choice. Well, Sydney's first choice was a monorail, but that's a story for another video. The reasons for this was that light rail was a cheap and easy option, especially because it would be able to reuse existing freight tracks that had originally been used to take cargo in and out of these areas. Both the DLR and the L1 Inner West Line were being done at a time, in the 80s and 90s, where governments weren't overly interested in spending a lot of money on public transport infrastructure. So the simplicity and cost-effectiveness of the light rail option proved very tempting when compared to more expensive underground metros. Although in both Sydney and London's cases, demand eventually proved too much for the light rail lines, and metros did have to get built after all with Canary Wharf getting its own stop on the London Underground, as well as a stop on the recently completed Elizabeth Line, and Piermont getting a stop on Sydney's upcoming Metro West Line. But at least at first, these light rail systems did help get these new precincts off the ground, by providing an easy connection to the rest of their city's rail transport network. In Sydney's case, this was done through a connection to the city's main railway hub at Central Station, where travellers could change for basically all of Sydney's suburban, intercity and regional train lines, as well as a number of bus and coach services. Starting construction in 1996 and opening just 16 months later, the first part of the L1 line to be built connected Central Station with Wentworth Park on Piermont's southwestern edge. The original line ran for just 3.6 kilometres, and ran from Central, where it actually reused a set of ramps that had originally been used by Sydney's historic tram network to access the station, down along a small street running section via Paddy's Markets and Haymarket, before connecting onto the old Metropolitan Goods Railway line. Running along this line, the route connected major new points of interest built as part of Darling Harbour's rejuvenation, including the city's exhibition and convention centres, Piermont Bay Wharf, where an interchange was possible with a new ferry route that also opened as part of the area's rejuvenation, and then the city's Star Casino. After the casino, the line passed through John Street Square, before reaching another point of interest in the city's fish market, although the fish market is currently being relocated, before terminating at Wentworth Park. So as you can see, the line ran in a kind of loop shape around the Piermont Peninsula, as the old freight alignment did all those years ago. This was fine for the original part of the line, but as we will see, it has become a bit of a drawback for the more recent additions to the L1. That said, the initial line did prove to be quite successful, 
which prompted the New South Wales government to extend it just three years later, adding four more new stops as the line ran through the inner west suburbs of Glebe, Annandale and eventually Lilyfield where the extension terminated. You can also notice just by looking at this map that the stop distances in the second phase are almost twice as far apart as those in the original part of the line. This reflects the changing purpose of the line, where the original section had just aimed to connect Darling Harbour and Piermont to the rest of the city's rail network, the new section was starting to become more of a commuter service, bringing commuters from Sydney's inner west into the Sydney city centre, a purpose that would benefit from the greater speed allowed for by less frequent stops. At the time, this was the full extent of the disused freight railway. Here it connected with a freight line that was still in use. This freight line connected the cargo port at White Bay with the rest of the city's freight network. But much like the docks in Darling Harbour, this port's usage fell with most of its cargo operations being relocated to Port Botany, and as such, its freight railway also fell into disuse. This paved the way for the line's third extension along that railway to Dulwich Hill. This extension opened in 2014 at a cost of just $176 million, and effectively doubled the length of the L1, adding a further 9 stops to the route. By completing this extension, a second major interchange with the city's suburban rail network was added at Dulwich Hill Station on the T3 Bankstown line. This extension is likely to be the last for the line, as there's just no more freight track for it to take over. Unless it's decided to extend it eastwards along the street, but there's not really been any talk of that. So, with the line basically complete, I think we can look and ask if it was actually a success. Well, I think yes, and I will get into that, but I also think it highlights the benefits and of course pitfalls of converting dedicated freight railways into passenger ones. Converting freight lines into passenger lines, especially in the form of light rail, has become popular the world over. I gave the example of the Docklands Light Railway in London earlier, but there are plenty of others. It's usually done because it's cheap and easy. The rail alignment already exists, so no new alignment needs to be acquired. And the route is already suitable for trains, so you're not going to have issues like slopes that are too steep. All you basically need to do is ensure the tracks are suitable for trams, add overhead wires if they're not there already, and build your tram depot. There's also the tram stops, but light rail stops tend to be a lot smaller and simpler than full train stations. In Sydney, for example, passengers can change platforms by simply walking across the tracks at simple crossing points, so few lifts and staircases need to be built. I mentioned before that the 6km third stage of the L1 cost just $176 million to build, which is a whole lot cheaper than the approximately $3 billion that was required to build the 12km L2 and L3 lines, which did not reuse old freight alignments. There were other things contributing to the excessive cost of the L2 and L3 lines, but I'll probably talk about those in another video. So, the L1 was relatively inexpensive and quick to build, but things are often cheap for a reason. Reusing freight alignments does make things easier, but those alignments were never designed with the idea of moving people in mind, and as a result, their routes don't always make that much sense from a passenger transit point of view. You can see this with the L1, where the line makes a big loop around Piermont rather than taking a more direct path through the suburb. This loop was originally built to serve the various docks on the Piermont Peninsula, but now this loop adds a considerable amount of time to the route's journey, and means that for many commuters travelling to the city from stops like, say, Lilyfield, taking the bus is still often the faster option. The old freight line was also not well integrated with the city's passenger rail network, because it didn't need to be. But that means the new light rail line now suffers from that lack of integration. The line passes directly under Sydney's major T1, T2 and T9 suburban train lines, but doesn't provide a proper connection with them. And the station it does connect with on the T3 line, Dulwich Hill, is a relatively minor station that not even all T3 trains stop at, though this will likely change as the line is converted to a metro. Some of the stops are also not always ideally located because the old freight line simply wasn't built to maximise commuter access. The stop at Roselle Bay, for example, was for the longest time not easily accessible from the actual suburb of Roselle, as there was no easy pedestrian path between them. That has changed recently though with the construction of a new park and pedestrian bridge, over 20 years after the stop was originally opened. But despite these various drawbacks, the L1 actually sees pretty decent usage with a ridership of around 10 million passengers per year pre-pandemic. On top of that, it set the stage for the light rail's comeback in Sydney, with two other light rail lines recently opened and another in Parramatta currently under construction. 
Additionally, some of the issues associated with converting freight railways into passenger ones, such as the land use surrounding the tracks, can be addressed by rezoning the land. By converting a lot of the low-density residential and industrial land surrounding the stops into higher-density residential and commercial developments, you can start getting the light rail line to achieve its full potential. Ultimately, turning freight tracks into light rail lines is effectively a transit quick win. It's cheap and fast, but not perfect. That said, it does represent an easy way to take a city that has little or no tram networks and start the process of establishing a significant light rail system. And with the right kind of planning, at least some of its pitfalls can be avoided. Plus, the L1 line in Sydney and other similar systems like the DLR in London prove that these kind of projects can achieve strong ridership numbers and can form a significant part of their city's transport networks. Well, I hope you enjoyed the video. If you did, consider giving it a like and subscribing to the channel. I'd also like to give a shout out to Sydney Trains Vlogs. A lot of the footage in the background of this video came from that channel. I'll put a link to it in the description if you want to see more. And of course, I'm City Moose. Thanks for watching.